This is a block diagram of our Cybernet receiver. There's nothing too remarkable about this, as it's an industry standard design. The type that you'd find in many receivers, new and old. So I've reverse engineered this from the circuit diagram, which we'll look at later on. This is a super heterodyne double conversion receiver. Super meaning above the range of human hearing and heterodyne or heterodyning is the action of mixing signals together. The conversion amount, i.e. double, single, triple, simply refers to the number of times the signal is mixed to an intermediate frequency. So let's look at a practical scenario for our Cybernet receiver. Imagine we live here on the edge of town and Alex, the local radio nuisance, lives on the other side of town. Now Alex's radio is set to channel 19 and he suddenly has this brainwave where he decides to educate the other radio listeners into the virtues of his favourite music. Thank you for coming home. Sorry that the tears are all I left them here, I could have sworn. These are my Meanwhile, George, who lives in the middle of town, is busy chatting away on Channel 40, along with his friends discussing his latest ailments and health issues. I, I went to the doctors and they gave me this new medication. I said, I, I can't take that. Anyway, he just looked at me and I said, well, why, do you, why have I got to take this? It, it's not me feet that are the problem. George and Alex are totally oblivious to each other's signals and their radio signals are travelling off into the ether along with shortwave radio broadcasts. GPS and communication satellite signals. Time clock transmissions. Wireless baby alarms. Television and radio broadcasts. Wi Fi, Bluetooth, mobile phones. Taxi and emergency services signals. Amateur radio transmissions. The fact is, by the time Alex and George's signals hit our antenna, they're accompanied with an absolute plethora of other signals, and it's the receiver's job to sort all this lot out. Okay, so let's look at this in more detail. Before we start, it's worth noting that the section from the antenna socket to the RF mixer is known as the receiver front end. So if we make reference to it, we know what we're talking about. So we have Alex and George's signals arriving at our antenna, along with a plethora of other signals. Plethora, I like that word. I don't think it's really a radio term. So our radio signals travel from the antenna via the SO239 socket into the transmitter output stage and then onto the AC coupling and protection circuits. The signals pick up DC from the transmitter stage and the AC coupling will block the DC and only let the RF signals pass. And the overload protection circuit is there to limit very strong signals traveling into the receiver. This is mainly for when the radio is in transmit mode. So our signals will pass through this stage and move on to the bandpass filter. This is a graphical illustration of our filter. However, in reality, it would look somewhat different. The vertical axis is the output level and the horizontal axis is the frequency. The red line represents the frequency response of the filter. So inside the red line, 
This is known as the band pass area and outside the red line is the band stop areas. We've got a center frequency, FC, of 27 megahertz. We've got a lower frequency, FL, of 26 megahertz and a higher frequency, FH, of 28 megahertz. So this filter has a 2 megahertz bandwidth which is FH minus FL. So Alex and George's signals are in the bandpass area of the filter and all the other signals, the plethora, are in the band stop area. So only Alex and George's signals will pass through to the next stage. Now the importance of the bandpass filter will become more clear the further we get down into the receiver. We now move on to the RF amplifier. The amplifier's primary function is to amplify small signals into larger, more manageable signals. However, it also controls the signal levels going into the receiver and even acts as an attenuator when needed. This is to control the signal levels so that we don't undersupply or overload the receiver. The amplifier is controlled by the gain control and the AGC circuits. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. Okay, so now we move on to the DC switch. This is again a sort of protection stage. It's simply for when the radio is in transmission mode, it will switch on and collapse all the stray RF coming from the transmitter. As we're currently in receive mode, our signals will pass through to the next stage. So now we move on to the RF mixer. The mixer does exactly what it says on the tin. It mixes the incoming RF signals with the local oscillator. This creates some and different frequency products. The receiver uses these products as intermediate frequencies, known as IF for short. So let's go through this. The selector is telling the RF synthesizer the radio is set to channel 19. We're in AM mode of operation and the synthesizer will carry out a calculation. Now bear in mind that our receive frequency is channel 19, 27.185 MHz. So the synthesizer will produce the first LO with a frequency of 37.88 MHz. How it arrives at this figure is that it calculates the sum of the IF frequency and the required receive frequency. In this case, the receiver's IF frequency is 10.695 MHz, and that's for AM, FM, and upper sideband. For lower sideband, the IF calculation is 10.692. Why this is different we'll cover as we go on. Let's look at what we'd expect to see at the output of the RF mixer. So in the middle here we have our fundamental signals. Alex and George's signals on channel 19 and 40. And we also have our first LO at 37.88 megahertz. Now these are first order products. If we look further up the scale, we've got George and Alex's signals up at around 66 megahertz. This is the sum of the first LO and the RF signals. So if we look down the scale, we've got Alex's signal on 10.695 megahertz and George's signal on 10.475 MHz. This is the first LO frequency minus Alex and George's signals. These are known as second order products. We're only interested in the lower frequency signals. So the primary function of this mixer is down conversion. Okay, so as we are on the AM, FM, IF path, we now move on to the low pass filter. 
As the name suggests, this filter only lets low frequency signals pass. Now I haven't tested the response of this filter, however I imagine the cutoff point is around 15 MHz. So the filter will remove the high frequency products from the IF, so we're only left with Alex and George at around 10, 11 megs. This is important as we don't want the other signals passing to the next stage. So now we move on to the IF mixer. And this behaves in the same way as the RF mixer. And again, we're only interested in the down conversion products. We have our second LO, this time at 10.24 megahertz. This is a fixed frequency signal and doesn't change when tuning the receiver. The LO is derived from the synthesizer board. However, it comes directly from the PLL timing crystal and is not derived from the VCO. Let's look at what we would see on the output of the mixer. So, as before, we've got our first order products and the sum products. And looking down the scale, we've now got Alex on 0.55 megahertz, which is 455 kilohertz, and George on 0.235 megahertz, which is 235 kilohertz. We now move on to the IF amplifier to boost the signals, and then we move on to the ceramic filter. This is a bandpass filter, it's called a ceramic filter simply because of the materials it's made up from, but it's just a narrow bandpass filter. The filter has a center frequency of 455 kilohertz, a lower frequency of 452 kilohertz, and a higher frequency of 458 kilohertz, which gives us a six kilohertz bandwidth. George's signal is now in the band stop area and Alex's signal is now square in the middle of the band pass area. So that means that only Alex's signal will pass to the next stage. As our receiver is set to AM receive mode, we now move to the AM demodulator. This will remove the carrier and produce an audio signal. The audio signal passes down to the audio amplifier and bingo jingo we've got Spandau Ballet blasting out of our loudspeaker. Okay, so let's look at the single sideband section of the receiver. The signal path through the front end is the same as before, however the IF signals are now picked up directly from the output of the RF mixer. They then move on to the crystal filter. The crystal filter is yet another bandpass filter, but this time with a much narrower bandwidth. So let's imagine we have a double sideband signal with a suppressed carrier. The selector is set to channel 19 and we're in USB mode of operation. As before, the synthesizer will produce an LO of 37.88 MHz. This represents our crystal filter. We have a center frequency, FC, of 10.695 MHz and a total bandwidth of 2.7 kilohertz. We have the upper sideband signal in the bandpass area of the filter and the lower sideband signal is in the band stop area so only the USB signal will pass to the next stage. Now if you're wondering why the lower sideband signals are up the scale rather than down this is because when the mixer LO frequency is higher than the signals, it will transpose the frequency position of the down converted products. Okay, so let's change the mode to lower sideband. 
the synthesizer IF calculation will now change to 10.692. This will have the effect of offsetting the first LO by minus 3 kHz. If we now look at our filter, the lower sideband signal has now shifted into the bandpass area of the filter. The upper sideband is now in the band stop area. So now only the LSB signal will pass to the next stage. OK, so now we'll move on to the IF amplifier, which will boost the signal, and then on to the single sideband product detector. As we only have a single sideband signal, the product detector introduces a carrier, which is derived from the carrier oscillator. The single sideband signal is mixed with the carrier, which results in the signal then resembling an AM signal. And this is demodulated in a similar way. The carrier oscillator produces a clean sinusoidal waveform and the frequency is matched to the IF. If the carrier oscillator frequency doesn't match the IF, then the audio will become unintelligible. The detector produces an audio signal and follows the same path as before. OK, so this is the Cybernet um, transceiver schematic in its entirety. OK, so our signal comes in via the SO239 socket and travels up to the transmitter output stage. The signals pass through this array of inductors and capacitors. This is the low pass filter for the transmitter. This will also affect our receive signals. We then move on to the receiver front end section of the schematic. So we've got C100. This is our AC coupling capacitor, which blocks the DC coming from the transmitter. We also have D18 and D19 back to back diodes, which makes up our overload protection. The signal then passes through an RF transformer, T7. We now move on to Q20, which is the RF amplifier, which is voltage controlled at this point by the gain control and the AGC circuits. The voltage swing at this point is around 0.6 of a volt to 1.8 volts. We then move on to T8. C104 and T9. This is a two order bandpass filter, and T9, once the signal passes through, steps down the impedance and then supplies Q22, the RF mixer. The first LO comes in at this point and joins the base of Q22 with the receive signals. The output of Q22 provides the IF frequencies and the IF comes away from T10, which then supplies the AM and SSB sections of the receiver. 